If there's something strange in the neighborhood, Tom Pot of the Pop Cult Pod, who are you going to call? And specifically, which character from March at the Movies would you actually call? Uh, there's a very obvious answer here, but I want to give you a chance to reflect and think twice. Because, again, it's just a, we go with the default, but maybe that's not the correct thing. So uh, as we get started here on page 180, March of the Movies, uh, Tom, who would you call? I've agonized over this question since you asked me. I don't I don't think you realize the Pandora's box that you opened. Um so look, I could call the Ghostbusters, but realistically, yeah. it could be a family or some really, really old guys. I, I could I could call podcasts from the Ghostbusters and get some tips. Um you know, I I could call God, King Kong or Godzilla. I, I called them before, it's a long story. Um I could call you know, Sydney Sweeney, what young man hasn't decided of giving her a call? I'd call but her, also yeah. she's a she she's a nun. And yeah. so you might not get very far there. No. And then I really had a mental breakdown. And I thought <laughs> about the phrasing. I thought about, hey, let's get all lawyer on your ass. You want to, you said call. Now most people would think, hey, it was the eighties when that phrase came up. Phone call, right? Mm. Webster's dictionary defines call <laughs> as to command or request to come or be present now that's like one of like 50 entries but that is very important to request something to be present i put to you jer didn't they use the thumper to call the sandworm in june oh therefore i would like the thumper so i can call a worm at my leisure so i'm having a bad day someone's being a dick boom your word food bitch <laughs> uh, I, I'm waiting too long on a bus. Hey, everybody, let's ride the worm. Um, and I can say that without getting arrested, like I usually do when I say that. So, yes, I've decided I'm going to call the sandworm. And we'll see how that goes. I'm sure it won't blow up my face at all. <laughs> this this sounds like a winning plan. Um, for me, I focus again. Like, yeah, it's it seems like a very simple, straightforward question on the face of it. But then when you parse it open, it uh, it it does open a Pandora's box of sorts. I focused in on the wording of this, but I focused in on the strange. And uh, I'm like, right, if there's something strange, if there's something a bit weird, and I'm like thinking about how would I deal with weirdos? And I think for me, the best way to deal with weirdos is to outweird them. Do you know what I mean? Um, like if someone comes up to you on a bus and like starts going, ah, oh, Christ is alive, you know, you can either indulge them and they know they're being strange and they know kind of they're looking for a reaction. And if you kind of treat them like they're strange, they're like, oh, what's your problem? But if you start going, they're going to leave you alone. <laughs> so you just outweird them all together and make them think you're the weirdo in the situation and they're uncomfortable and they need to leave. And then that's how you get your peace. So with that in mind, I'm going to call the giant moth from Godzilla X Kong and just be oh. like, what are you going to do with this? What are you going to do, ghosts? There's a fucking moth here. It's giant. And I don't know if it has superpowers or not, but what are you going to do with this? And the ghosts are going to be like, okay, that's fine. Look, I don't want no beef here, man. That's, this, is, this is between you. So um, that's who I'm calling. Mothri or Mothma. I didn't even Mothra, know. God. Get her Mothra, put some respect David. on her name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I really won't. I shall not put respect on her name. <laughs> Tom, for anyone watching in uh, this on YouTube now at the moment, they may notice a bit of a strange locale for you. Uh, you're actually, this is an international edition of March at the Movies. Uh, I understand you're recording this, a very nice swivel. Uh, I, I do appreciate a good chair swivel. Um, you're recording this from uh, the United States of America, live from New I, York City. Yeah, live. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you said yeah. in the United States as opposed to Connecticut. Is, <laughs> you know, of all the places I've, I, I've been in the last week and a half, you got me in. Connecticut, <laughs> not New York, not Philadelphia, Connecticut, which is great. No, yeah, I've been uh, traveling the last week a bit, uh, going up around the, the last few states. I've been in New York, Philadelphia, New Jersey, very film center, actually. I, done, I ran up the rocky steps in Philadelphia. Um, I, I stood outside the quick stop in New Jersey from Clerks. Uh, I had what Sally was having in Cat's Delicatessen from <laughs> Harry and Met Sally, and then I got to Connecticut. Amazing. Yeah. And then just, yeah, the journey is swiftly ending. <laughs> yes. yes. Reality is set in. 
Would you go to can you can you go to WWE HQ? Is that a thing people can do, or is there like um, do you have I've to sign had, NDAs I, now at this? Yeah, stage? I've seen it before. <laughs> I don't know if I want to be near that headquarters anyway. Yeah, no. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Uh, I think generally I probably arrest people that go there. <laughs> um, but then again, uh, you know, be an interesting one. I go go for a tryout. Uh, yeah. No, um, I I pass it. I'm not sure, but yeah, I mean, I got my wrestling fix in Philadelphia anyway yeah. because. They're getting ready for Mania. Uh, I yeah. met Becky Lynch as well, and she nice. was like, "Oh, you want to Mania?" I was like, "No, no, I'm in Philadelphia the week before WrestleMania, Becky." <laughs> Why? <laughs> <laughs> Which, yeah, that's not that's not taunting myself or hurting myself. <laughs> Speaking of WrestleMania, I hear the low blows are coming back. We are coming back. The Woolshed this Saturday. Um, first time in seven years in the Woolshed. First WrestleMania party in four years. First WrestleMania party in the Woolshed because the last party we ran was a Royal Rumble night in eight years. So since 2016. So very surreal. It's uh yeah, it's gonna be exciting. Tickets available, eventbrite.ie. Uh get on it. It's gonna be a lot of fun. I cannot wait. Uh we're keeping our cards close to our chest. Tickets selling really well. Um, I'm delighted people actually remembered who we were um and seem excited to be uh back. Uh but yeah, get in on it, guys. If you haven't got tickets already, uh we do have uh space there, tables and stuff like that. We are sold out of table bookings but we didn't book all the tables we didn't reserve all of them for a booking so there is loads of seats and stuff like that as well uh, but get on that because that is going to fill up fast over the next week um we've got a lot to get to so let's talk about movies and let's uh let's t- we're going to be talking oh, about oh, you- oh, i think you're getting a bit ahead of ourselves sir i don't know if you recall we made a certain bet oh, don't recall that on the nope. last episode because for those who need a refresher course Jer included we had a little bit of a bet oh. on who would win uh best actor best actress best supporting and all those and it came down to me in my infinite wisdom i said you know what Lily Gladstone won't win. It'll be Emma Stone. <laughs> I said that. That was clearly the first thought I said. I didn't change my thing because we had the same answers. Not at all. No. So, yeah, it came down to that one. And to the surprise of many, Emma Stone won. And that yes. means I won the bet. Which God means I got to it. give you homework. Lovely. Okay. Uh, okay. So what we agreed then, if I remember right, it's coming back to me now, is that we agreed you'd get to dictate I'd have to review a movie for the next one. And obviously you're not going to give me an amazing movie to review. I take it. You're going to give me yes. Homework. By yeah, the I, can, I, I can watch it. I can watch amazing films anytime I want. I want you to watch a terrible film. But I'm not watch. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Fair enough. So there's, 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 I'm not going to you know hang it over your head for a while. I want to, I want to put it in right now. Um, okay. I, I got rid of my Netflix subscription. I used to be paying from like a, a country where oh. it was really cheap and now I, it's got expensive. So oh. my parents, Notoriously watch terrible films. Oh. And they keep asking me about one. Oh no, I know what you're gonna say. Maybe I'm nostalgic for home for Ireland. <laughs> I want you I to check out Ireland's own Lindsay Lohan in Irish Wish for our next episode. <laughs> and just give me a report so I can tell my parents how bad it is. Oh no. Okay, okay. Nathan I was... I did so well to avoid this. I'm like, I've watched enough movies for the show. I don't need to get this in. I did so well. Fuck you, Lily Gladstone. Fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't bring it home. Like, oh, that, that, okay, right. Look, so I'll watch Irish Wish for the next episode. Um, All the while cursing Lily Gladstone. I'll, I'll That's fair. report back with my thoughts. <laughs> Fuck. Tom, look, I'm really busy. I've got WrestleMania. Like, can we not? Oh, look, fine. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. Okay. Maybe, it, maybe it'll be good. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> I haven't seen one person say that, including all of the cast in promoting it. Mm, but... I think it's like it seems like everyone's trying to forget it. Yeah. yeah. I wonder why. <laughs> I wonder why. We'll give it a look. We're get, we got a lot of good movies to focus on uh in this episode. We're gonna be uh, looking at Dune Part Two, obviously. Uh we're gonna be looking at the new uh you may notice if you're watching Tom has the his Godzilla t shirt on. We're gonna be looking at the new Godzilla X Con. Uh, movie the new empire we're going to be looking at another empire a frozen one in this case in the in the case of ghostbusters i've got a recommendation uh for tom that uh i think may be right up his alley plus uh we're also going to be uh, taking a litmus test on the career of sydney sweeney when we discuss immaculate but first before we get underway um let's talk about our movie of the month uh, and guys by the way if you're listening for the first time uh we aren't doing spoilers in here you are in a safe zone um so we're just going to preview we want to get 
you excited for these movies if you haven't seen them or kind of talk about it if you have uh, but we won't be doing spoilers Tom I'll kick it over to you there was one big movie that we're both looking forward to uh, last month uh, but did it live up to the hype is it your movie of the month or is uh, do we have an out of the box pick uh, it's we. I don't have an out of the box pick. It seems <laughs> no, like no. Um, it's pretty much yeah, slam dunk. I mean, the movie of the month was June Part Two, yeah, uh, yeah. without a doubt. I I think like going into it, we were all very excited for it, and the fact that it stuck the landing was very impressive. Um, I would say I actually prefer Part Two to Part One. Yeah. Um, a, a friend of mine who has actually read the book um was saying that he preferred Part One. So you know, what mileage may vary depending on whether you've seen it or not. I just thought this felt like, like part one, I had a few criticisms of. It felt very much, very fr- like, like it was backloaded. You know, it was like, oh yeah, we're getting to the story, and that's enough for this part. It felt like it was a lot of building. This is where it felt like there was a lot more payoff. Yeah, it felt like the world was set up in the first one, and now we were getting a chance to explore it a bit more. Um, I mean, Denny Villeneuve tends to not miss, uh, and this is clearly an example of him hitting pretty hard. Uh, the cinematography I thought was amazing. Um, it's such a stunning landscape and the, the use of colour and lack of colour in some of the scenes especially was really impressive to watch. I thought the sense of scale was amazing um, and it, it, that's a weird thing to say because we're going to be talking about something like Godzilla versus Kong later on and, and all these kind of things but the scale in this movie was much more impressive like even just the vastness of the desert they really got across with the way it was shot. The size of the sandworms like you're literally like holy shit. Mm. Um, performance wise I thought it was really good across the board. Timothy Chalamet is an actor that like, you know, I think it's very easy to kind of throw him away as an actor and be like, oh, he's, you know, the pretty boy face of the moment. But he can give great performances, um, as we've seen, you know, more and more recently, it seems like. And he, he's good here as a character, I think. And I think if I had one criticism of it, actually is kind of the Paul Atreides character. Because um, I do, I do like the character and I know what they're doing and what they're going for. But there is a lot of in this movie of being like, you can't do that, Paul Atreides. My God, Paul Atreides did it. You know, <laughs> it's like, you know, and I, I know they're going for that kind of messiah character that can do all that. But I, I don't hear any of those people that were like, this character is a Mary Sue. I don't hear any of those characters uh, or people speaking up all of a sudden is all I'm going to say. Uh, but I think he's very good in it. Rebecca Ferguson is great in it. Uh, Zendaya, who, you know, again, Zendaya is someone who like, he will easily kind of throw her aside as an actress uh, as far as her performances go. She's really good in this, and she's a really good performer. Um, I think the the elephant in the room when it comes to performances, and it's funny, so everyone I know has said this. Uh, I didn't feel necessarily as much, um, but Christopher Walken. Yes, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I think it's it's like I don't think it's a bad performance. I think it's just that everyone else feels like they're putting on a performance, and Christopher Walken just feels like he's just himself. Yeah. You know, he's like, oh, I'm out here. I'm the emperor of the desert. Oh, you know, <laughs> it's just like, oh. sand up his ass. <laughs> yeah, 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 pretty much, yeah. But I think aside from that, it's like, I think it kind of worked. I don't think it was as bad. It didn't take me out of the movie, but it did make yeah. me kind of go, oh, that's that that's Christopher Walken. Everyone else was like, oh, yeah, that's that's a character. Oh, no, no, that's Christopher Walken. Mm. <laughs> I really liked um, Austin Butler as well uh, as a creepy, weird man. Uh I did think uh, it was interesting to kind of feel like they move away from the villains of the last one, which makes me excited for for part three. Um, Dune Messiah, I think, is what we're getting next. Um, I did like the ending as well. The ending is kind of very dramatic and it feels like set up for part three again. And I think that's, in a lesser film, that would be really annoying, I think. The mm-hmm. whole, like, you know, like sequel bait and cliffhanger. And we had a lot of that with the first part as well. I think it really worked here because, um, it, I mean, first of all, the movie was a big success, but it feels like I got enough out of this movie where it didn't hurt me. Like, if, if they never made another one, I feel like I'd still be satisfied with what I got here, which if they had made part one and they never made part two, I'd have been pissed. Uh, but no, I think it's really strong film, great performances. Uh, the score is really good by Hans Zimmer. Uh, Cinematography is great. I mean, it's just, yeah, it's a feast to the eyes and ears. Uh, I think it's really good. I think, like, we need more sci-fi blockbusters like this, um, which are kind of... You know, calling them adult sounds almost dismissive to a certain degree because when people think adult, they just think swearing, violence, blood. But no, no, this is just mature in its themes and its ideas and it just feels unrestrained. And we don't get that very often, I think. Yeah. The amount of directors who can actually do that are very limited. And the fact that Denny Villeneuve is one of them is, I think, a real treasure for anyone who loves cinema. So it's, yeah, uh, Doom Bar 2, definitely movie of the month for me, easily. 
Yeah, I uh, agree. It's not even close. Uh, this may end up being my favorite movie of the year. It may make my all time top 50. Um, I loved this movie. I loved this experience. And like you say, kind of to pick up on that last point, in a world where cinematic blockbusters, now I know last year with Barbie and Oppenheimer kind of changed, and again with Marvel kind of going in the opposite direction, it changed our perception of cinema and maybe big time cinema, but with a bit more focus on quality than IP necessarily um, is, is, is making a comeback. And in a world where the past decade of cinema in terms of our blockbusters have been so dominated by essentially Marvel stories following that playbook. And I love that playbook. We cover Marvel so much on this show. Um, but I think I'm ready for a change and I'm ready for that focus on quality. And I think Denis Villeneuve, what he does here is marry that kind of IP and telling a great established story with characters we know and have longed to see on the big screen in much the same way that kind of, Marvel and the likes have fed that hunger for so many years and capitalized and succeeded so well in. But you have that, it, it it's that kind of appeal mixed with a kind of Christopher Nolan level mastery. You know, I think um, for me, I think this is something that like, I'm looking at Denis Villeneuve in a whole new light after this. When you'd step back and look at what he's really done here, and I'm thinking of him as in, is he the the defining filmmaker of our generation? You know what I mean? Now, I'm not saying the back catalogue he has. It's very strong. You know, you've got Arrival, uh, the Blade Runner remake. You've got Sicario and obviously Doom Part 1. Um, but I'm talking about, like, is he now leading the way in the same way that Christopher Nolan was leading the way for, for, for so long in terms of um, redefining cinema? And being, say, uh, like Christopher Nolan maybe took the baton, you could say, from Scorsese or Tarantino, you know what I mean? And um, I think Villeneuve may be that guy. And I think this is such a home run success. I'm delighted with the box office success as well. Um, but I think this for the likes of Villeneuve, but also Chalamet, Zendaya and Austin Butler, who, again, are all established stars. This isn't the first time we've seen them by any means, but... This is their superstar at the moment. This is where the passing of the torch. This is what for to them what a new hope was for George Lucas, Mark Hamill, Carrie Fisher, and Harrison Ford. Now, these are some of the defining names we will see over the next 20 to 30 years in cinema. And this is the moment that we'll look back on. And I think it's a touch point moment for cinema. And look, we're fans of genre as well. We are fans of great cinema and independent cinema and challenging um cinema. I think, you know, we look at the Oscar speech and the creator of American fiction gave uh, creator of American fiction gave a great speech at the Oscars about instead of making one two hundred million dollar movie, why don't you make ten twenty million dollar movies? And I think we love that as well. But we do like our big blockbusters. We do like going to the cinema for um you know a show and to be blown away. Um, and I think in this as well, this is a touch point for this generation. It's like this generation's Lord of the Rings now, you know what I mean? Especially if they can knock it out of the park with Messiah. And that's how I felt watching this, and that's why I love this. I was much the same as yourself in that I felt the first movie was interesting, fun, good, enjoyed it. Um, loved the story of Dune. Haven't gone into the weeds, but I've I've read as far as kind of the Messiah story and, and kind of all of Paul's um arc if, if you want um without getting too much into the weed so i was really excited for this the first movie i was both i i, I loved it on one level I, I loved the experience i loved villeneuve be i love villeneuve's perception of the world and being able to when you look at the last two movie david fincher i think you know they just didn't get it you know and it was just like they just couldn't do it and if anything it kind of um hardened Dune's reputation for being unadaptable. Um, and, and and that kind of proved the point when a filmmaker as talented as Fincher wasn't able to do it. But I think Vill Villeneuve nailed that and nailed the aesthetic and the feel and the vibe and what Dune needs to be. I think he really gets it. But also I felt much the same as yourself, that there was a lot of plot missing. You know, I, I came away from that going, I'd love that but a TV show because what they took away from that element of the Dune book was 
the kind of mystery, like the 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 kind of the the thriller element, the kind of who done it element as well, like kind of the political intrigue and kind of the 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 palace intrigue of discussions with men in rooms. You know, they didn't really capture that in a way that you can with TV. Um, and I'd loved seeing it done in a Game of Thrones style thriller. The difference for me is here they got it. It, cl- it clicked on every level. They had established the world. They'd established the characters. They'd shown us enough and we were in. And then they slowed the plot right down. And they let you live in that world. And they let you luxuriate in it. And that played to Villeneuve's strengths. Because now he can just bring you into this. And what I liked about it as well was that, again, Villeneuve came out in the promo for this movie and was saying that, I don't think movies should have... Uh, I, if it was up to me, movies wouldn't have dialogue. It'd just be an immersive experience. And I think that's kind of, I got that from Doom Part 1. I'm like, yeah, you just want to show us this world and go, look how cool it is. Um, But I think one thing that he got, re- and it, that kind of set my expectations for like, okay, maybe I might feel like I did for Part 1. But one thing I think this movie got really right was the character beats. I thought it was excellent. Um. I loved uh, Javier Bardem in this. He was my highlight of this. Um, just adding levity to this world. Like, I loved it. He felt very Life of Brian. You know, it's like, the Mahdi is too humble to accept he's the Mahdi. Yeah. Even more reason to think he is. Yeah. <laughs> it was, I loved I it. Think, I think the movie was actually understated about the comedy. Ender. I laughed more than I expected to. And he was the big part of that. He was like, let the but uh, nowhere. And you're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and I, like, I didn't expect to laugh once. And you know what I mean? I expected right. to feel cold. And it, there is an element of that like this isn't the perfect movie you touched on Christopher Walken I don't need to add I, I, I just plus one everything you said there um you know there was elements of it and there's, there's no such thing as a perfect movie you can have one of your favorite movies of all time and identify like Pulp Fiction is my favorite movie of all time I absolutely hate Quentin Tarantino's character in that you know what I mean but it's still the perfect movie for me um and in much the same way and this isn't a critique I thought you know there was just the only thing this was missing for me was that emotional connection. I wanted to hate the Harkonnen. I wanted to really root for the Fremen. Um, and then that makes kind of what happens e- even more of a sting. Um, but like I wanted to have that cathartic yes moment, you know what I mean? And I don't feel that I did. I had loads of wow moments and I had loads of like holy shit. And I did like where the story went. It made me think and it's still making me think about where it's going because um it's interesting. So I don't think it, it missed out on a character beat, but I just didn't have that catharsis that I wanted to have with a movie that maybe you get in a Star Wars or you get in the Lord of the Rings. But I thought everyone in here nailed the brief. Tim D. Chalamet in particular, he has to go. And I thought about this, like, throughout this car- this movie, he has to go from essentially starting it as Percy Jackson to being Neo, to being almost Walter White by the end of it. You know what I mean? There are elements of all uh, in what he has to straddle. And I think he nailed it here. And I think... Chalamet, for whatever reason, doesn't get the love that he deserves since he's kind of gone mainstream. And I get it. He's got the Kardashian girlfriend. He's got like kind of the, uh, you know, we've been watching him on kind of the award season and stuff like that. And you're watching him not necessarily for the quality of his work. And people want to roll their eyes at Wonka. But I think we need to now establish that this guy is fucking good at what he does. And he himself may like go down as a defining actor of our generation. You know what I mean? And that's kind of, but that's the, the that's why I think in, in spite of the little nitpicks we can come up against, this movie is a triumph because we're not just thinking of this in terms of um, was it a good movie or not? Did they stick the landing? We're thinking of what does this mean for our generation of cinema? <laughs> and you've done a good job when that happens. And there's so much cinema in this. Like Villeneuve knows how to use sound and visual effects and cinemat- cinematography to the max. It's such, I almost like, I loved watching Doom Part 1 ahead of this uh, and, and getting into it, but you lose a lot of that cinema effect in watching it. And that's why Villeneuve railed so hard, because obviously, for those don't know, Doom Part 1 was released in the middle of COVID. Um, it got the max treatment and there was kind of a limited release just because, you know, it was lockdown. P- cinemas weren't open and there was quite a visceral reaction from him to that uh, being simultaneously released on HBO Max because you do lose a lot of that. Like he knows when 
to make and how to make things hit like a helicopter exploding or um characters laugh even down to little things like characters laughing in beats of silence and how that builds tension to big spectacular uh like explosion as it hits the ground you know what i mean that's just one kind of scene that they had there um that was absolutely breathtaking um and he knows how to build to these kind of huge climactic moments, like the sandworm moment that you spoke about, like the, the one we're all thinking of when we say that. But he sets it up. And so many times when you see a director going for it, you know, it's very difficult to pull off that it rewards the anticipation that they built. But you do end up sitting back knowing full well I know what he's going for here and I know what's going to happen. And you still end up sitting in the back of your chair going, fuck me. <laughs> that was amazing. Um, there were constant points, particularly through the last half hour, both when the moments were big and when they were small, that made me just sit there in the screening and just say, <laughs> and just be like, holy mm. shit. <laughs> It's one of the most rewarding and satisfying endings to a genre movie I, like this I can think of. And I include the iconic movies like Lord of the Rings and Star Wars in there. You know, I'm I'm like, holy shit, like this, you got me. Like you, you took me left where I was. I, I, I thought like at one point I'm like, this was the end. And I'm like, okay, that's good. And then I'm like, oh, you took me left from there. Oh, you took me left from there again. Um, not just in terms of character, but in execution, like the battles felt big. They felt generational. They felt, again, pushing the medium forward, um, which, again, makes this not just a great movie. It makes it an achievement in cinema. Um, and like, again, there were some instantly iconic kind of moments throughout this that will just forever be embedded in my mind. And I can't wait to watch them over and over, especially as this kind of gets released um, to kind of watch in our own time. But what I loved about them as well was as much of a showpiece as they were, they never felt excessive. They never felt like unnecessary. They never felt showy. They felt part of this world. They felt true to the characters. They felt true to the scale that they built. And this was just remarkable. They nailed this from start to finish. And we were all hoping they would and we were all anticipating they would. And so often when you go into that, it's how often do we speak about this? You know, you go into things and you've heard this is going to be the best thing ever. And you walk out of it going, this is the best thing ever. Because so often your expectations just can't be met. And they just not only met my expectations, they took a sandworm and fucking drove right through my expectations and took them to a brand new fucking level. Um, so bravo to all involved. This was phenomenal. I loved it. We're getting into that blockbuster time of year though so um we're gonna talk about some of the other ones there were some other big swings here um that didn't hit as much as doing so <laughs> let's talk about them we're gonna get into some quick hits and some other reviews <laughs> Speaking of sequels, uh, we're going to get kicked off here with uh, Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. A hard left <laughs> turn from talking about the heights of Dune Part 2. Uh, obviously following up to uh, Ghostbusters Afterlife, which many would see as a successful reboot of the franchise. Um, brought a lot of the main characters back for another uh, adventure. Swapped the more country, uh, I think it was Oklahoma the original was based in, for a more traditional Ghostbusters vibe in New York City. Um, Tom, talk to me about Frozen Empire. Did this work as... The, well, did, first off, did you think the first one worked? Were you a fan? And did this match the, the first one or your expectations or what were your thoughts? I feel like I'm going to lose all my film credit uh, in this episode, <laughs> having lavish praise on Dune and now. Uh, I'm going to say some positive things about Ghostbusters. Um, okay. So I one of my earliest memories in life is the first Ghostbusters movie. Yes. Um, I remember literally one of my earliest memories is them being covered in marshmallow walking around New York City at the end. <laughs> I waited my whole life for another Ghostbusters movie. Because by the time I was born, Ghostbusters 2 would come out. Uh, and then we got the 2016 one, which I was kind of like, oh, yeah, all right. But it was like, I never got a third Ghostbusters movie. Uh, and then Afterlife came along. 
And at the time I said in a review, because I went back to watch my review of that after, uh, and I said something on the lines of like, I think I'm generally very impartial as a reviewer and fair and reasonable. I think Ghostbusters is my blind spot. <laughs> um, because I did like Afterlife, having rewatched it for this, yeah, it's uh, it's a bit of a mess of a film. I, I like it, but it's it's an odd film in that the first part of it is kind of like, you know, a, an indie film that has nothing to do with Ghostbusters. And then it gets very pandery. And when I went into this, I was like, OK, this is probably the go- going to be as close to the Ghostbusters film I've wanted my whole life to be. The Ghostbusters are back in New York um, and they're fighting a monster. And it's not, you know, the same kind of reboot stuff we always get where it's like, oh, it's Zool. Oh, well, it's fucking Vigo the Carpathian, which would be weird if they fought a painting again. This would be amazing. <laughs> um, I actually quite enjoyed this. Okay. Um, I, I, the critics are very negative and very down on it. Um, and I think some of it is valid and some of it is in, in, unfair, I would say. Now, I will say a, a lot of things, as I said, I, I preface a lot of that by saying I have a blind spot here because I've waited for another Ghostbusters movie, but it, it's not a perfect film by any means. <laughs> it's um, not perfect. <laughs> definitely not a perfect film. I know that's a big, that's a big stretch. Um, first of all, you could drive fucking the Ecto-1 through all the plot holes in some of this. Like, I mean, why why is it okay for just a family to all of a sudden be like, yeah, we're going to be the Ghostbusters. Oh, that's okay, right? Okay. Very odd choice. I mean, first of all, I don't understand, like, Carrie Coon, who had no real interest in the Ghostbusters off in the last movie, now she's like, yeah, let's go, right, ghosts. Yeah. I'm like, oh, that's okay. Um, Finn Wolfhard, you know, he's he liked driving the car, now he's fighting ghosts. Uh, Paul Rudd, like, is the one where I'm like, okay, that makes sense. And then we have Phoebe, who's like, what, 15 years old? And it's like, yeah, get her involved. I'm like, I, I just think that's a real leap in logic. And I think actually one of the big problems with this film is the amount of stuff they carry over from Afterlife. Um, I feel like they were, it's almost like I feel like they were worried of hurting, about hurting anyone's feelings. A lot of the characters from Afterlife didn't really need to come back. Yeah, I don't know why Podcast is here. I don't know why... Celeste O'Connor, I can't remember her character's name, is here. Totally pointless. Honestly, they de- didn't find anything good to do with Finn Wolfhard in the first film, yeah. and they haven't found anything good for him to do here. And that's the same with a lot of the characters, because there's just too many characters in this. Yeah, And that goes doubly for the story. There's way too much story stuff going on here. You know, there's a romantic subplot, or semi-romantic subplot, about a girl ghost. Yeah, There's plots about Slimer, there's plots about this, there's plots about the Ghostbusters uh, kind of empire uh, and all this. It's like, this is this is too much. Um, and it kind of feels like it's ruining the momentum of the film a bit. Uh, it felt a little bit long at times because of that, because it just felt like, oh God, I'm not interested in this story now. You know, and in there, there is a good story in there. If they were, if it was a bit more focused, I like the whole, the whole dynamic of like Paul Rudd and Carrie Coon and they're taking Phoebe in and you know, her trying to find her place, and Paul Rudd is trying to get her to recognize her or him as her, as her kind of surrogate father figure and all that. That works. It's very cliche, but it could work. But I just think like, I don't think anyone could watch this and like Phoebe's whole story of being like, I want to be a Ghostbuster, and it's like you can't. You're too young. I don't know anyone that's going to watch this and be like, yeah, let her be a Ghostbuster. Yeah. Everyone in their right mind would be like Walter Hecking, like, no, that's totally valid. You're 15 years old. Get back <laughs> to school. What are you doing? Um. I thought the original Ghostbusters were a lot better used in this. Um, I thought like in the last one, it was kind of like a real, really kind of manipulative, messy inclusion where it was like all of a sudden they just showed up in the costumes like, that's right, did someone call Ghostbusters? And you're like, oh God, why did that happen? Here they felt somewhat weird in it. Dan Aykroyd and Ernie Hudson, uh, especially um, because clearly they're the ones that are interested in Ghostbusters. Um Bill Murray is there, you know. I, I got an after two out of Bill Murray. I I don't feel like some like they've been overusing Bill Murray um in this, even though it, it clearly like he did not want to be there. Clearly, yeah. he's just standing there wearing sunglasses. I think what really worked is, and I think again they would work a lot better if it wasn't for the fact that there are too many characters in this already. Where some of new inclusions, I like James A. Caster, um as a kind of techie nerdy Ghostbuster. I think that's a character that could have worked. And honestly, when you look at some of the characters included here. It's impossible, I think, not to just point out a few and be like, I wish this guy, this guy, this guy, and maybe this person were the Ghostbusters team instead mm-hmm. of this 
mishmash of like 20 Ghostbusters, like where at the end they're all firing proton packs and you're like, it kind of doesn't feel as special as it used to when there were just a few of them. When everyone is just firing lasers, it loses its uh, its impact. Yeah. Uh, Pat Noswald, I liked, even though he's just there for exposition. Um, I think the real scene stealer in this, um, and I don't think it's a surprise to anyone who's kind of watched his work on other things, is Kamel Nanjiani. Yes. I thought he was excellent in this. I thought like most of the laughs came from him. I thought the villain was about as, you know, as developed as they needed it to be. Um, it's, you know, it's kind of pointless just a character for them to get into. But I did like that it was actually an original villain. Uh, as opposed to them going back to the well um and aside from that i i liked i liked the kind of there was a bit of fun about it uh, it was it was kind of a ghostbusters movie that feels like they they wouldn't normally make and i don't like i kind of don't like the fact that ghostbusters has become something it never really was like and i think afterlife was more egregious in that regard afterlife kind of felt like this sappy kind of blockbuster film at times and you're like that's not what ghostbusters ever really was mm. it was kind of a more comedic Thing that happens to have some action and it feels like since they need to kind of weaponize all our nostalgia it was like they need the proton packs they need to fight something big because that's where movies are going now and i think this movie is more guilty of it but i think it managed to, to do a, a decent job of still making it feel a bit like a comedy um compared to afterlife if i like this I, I as i said i think i have a blind spot for it. it's 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 not great but it's probably as close to the Ghostbusters movie I've wanted um, since childhood. Uh, it felt, actually, it felt more like a cartoon from the Ghostbusters because it's really over the top and extreme. I, I would say I, I prefer, I wish I wish there was more ghost busting in it. Yeah. <laughs> and it kind of feels like there's a lot of, you know, build up to this villain. And then when we get to it, it's, it's over relatively quickly. And I, I I do think I, I as much as I think the Phoebe character has her problems, I do like the performance by um, McKenna Grace. I always try to call her Grace McKenna because it just yeah. feels like those would be swapped turns. Um, <laughs> but um, but no, other than that, like I think there's the bones of a good film here. It's not what I realized, but I did have fun with it uh, much more than I expected to after seeing the reviews. I hope it succeeds. Mm. Uh, I don't think it's doing massively well. Uh, I I but I think like. It's weird going from a position where for my most of my my childhood and my teen years that I was never going to get a Ghostbusters film. And now I'm kind of like this. We've had like three in the last less than 10 years. I, I don't know if I, if I want them to keep going down this road. Yeah. I don't know how much, you know, I think like if they're doing another one, there needs to be a serious rejig with the team and the characters um, and kind of what they actually want. Because I think this is a messy film, but uh, I thought it was an entertaining mess. Uh, I think I'm definitely kind of losing some of my credo saying that, but yeah, I I I had fun with Frozen Empire, even though it's not a great film. We all sense. we all have those tastes. I don't think it's it. I don't think it's anything to do with credibility. I think kind of you know we all have those things that make us nostalgic, and there's a lot to be said for just hearing the Ghostbusters team in a cinema you know what i mean like again yeah. it just brings out that because people of kind of our age range would feel very much the same when it comes to ghostbusters and that it does bring out that nostalgia there and i think to me i felt slightly differently i really liked afterlife um and, and i thought that it worked uh just because it was so unabashed uh and shameless in this fan service it just went for it um it knew what people want I don't think it over thought it. I, I got why it was a bit more emotional because again, you're dealing with kind of the death of Harold Ramis and they want to kind of pay homage to him. Um, And it got out of its own way. It didn't try over convolute the plot. It, it needed the characters. They wanted to um throw back and respect and give people the old characters, but also try set up a new world. And um, I thought that felt good. For me, Gil Keenan directed this after kind of writing Afterlife. And we see this quite a lot, especially in IB, where someone is being um kind of groomed to take over the franchise. You know, someone who's seen as kind of a senior writer is, gets a shot at it. And it felt that way um to me, where it was kind of like, oh, you've graduated and now we have to sit through your interpretation of this. Um, rather than feeling connected to the first movie because it was like he had his run at it, if that makes sense. Um, rather than the same team kind of bringing a, a really, um, you know, again like this just seemed like it was there to, for the sake of creating a Ghostbusters movie and that printing money rather than there being one kind of strong um, 
you know, uh, vision here that they were presenting. For me, I got, in a way, I got a media kind of modern Indiana Jones vibes with the more recent movies. Uh, but for me, I also think that they could have taken a lesson or two from The Dial of Destiny, which I think, because a lot of franchises will do this, they'll reboot and they'll kind of go, um, they'll recast the main characters sometime, or they'll try to do uh, passing at the torch moment with the old characters and uh, whatnot. Whereas I thought what Dial of Destiny unlocked is that just give the people what they want. They want to hear the Indiana Jones theme song. They want Harrison Ford. They want a caper. Just give it to them. Like you don't, you you can you don't need to fuck around. The Dial of Destiny worked kind of in, in much of the same way Afterlife did because it was shameless. It was like this is what you want. I'm gonna give it to you. It's not gonna be the best movie you ever see, but we're not trying to make the best movie you ever saw. Um. For the, for me, this just just didn't work because again, like they just couldn't get out of their own way. They wanted, like you said, they wanted to do too much. There's fifty Ghostbusters here. No one's getting the time to kind of be who they like. And even the parts that they set up in the first movie that worked, I thought they set up the characters that made the backbone of this movie quite well. Like the reason podcast was in it was because I ah, can't not have podcast. He was great, you know. But they didn't have anything for him to do. In the same way with Lucky, like that when she showed up, it's like. Okay, first off, why is she here? And secondly, why is she here and they don't know she's here? Like, they're ghost busting. How are they like, what are you doing here? It's like, she's part of your operation. How do you not know that your friend is your co-worker? I'm like, it's just wild. Like, um, And then you have all these new kind of people. Like, I wasn't a big fan of James A. Caster. I am a fan of him as a comedian and I'm glad to see him on the big screen. But um, I just didn't feel like they got why James A. Caster worked. You know what I mean? Like, I think, I think uh, uh, you know, we've seen so many success stories. Bill Burr kind of in a lot of, uh, is a great kind of success story for when you get just a stand-up, a really talented stand-up comedian Comedian, you cast him in various roles, but every role you see Bill Burr in, he puts a new spin on the Bill Burr character that we know. And I'm like, I could absolutely see James Acaster as kind of this nerdy guy. Um, but let him be funny, let him be James Acaster in a way. Remind us why we like him because you're doing a bit of stunt casting here, but I'm up for that. Uh, and they just made him a, a bit of a nerd and, and they tried to force him to act and they tried to make him go to the role rather than writing the role to suit him, if that makes sense. Um, there was a touch of the Stranger Things vibe about it as well. Um, the more modern season, especially with the kids kind of outgrowing their role. Like again, I I get why you say uh, podcast. You know why was he here? Because the reason podcast was good in the first movie was because he was cute and plucky. But he, he's he's old now. You know what I mean? It's like The Simpsons. It's like the older they get, the cuter they ain't. <laughs> you know. That's... I thought I thought it was a recast first. Like, I was like, is, yeah. is that podcast? What's happening? He had a glow up all over and over, like. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Whereas, like, you have Finn Wolfhard, and he's he's straddling boat now. Where it's like, stop aging, Phil Wolfhard. You're ruining everything. Um, he's now taller than Kamel and Johnny, who let's not forget is a Marvel hero. <laughs> um, there's a massive tone shift as well, and I agree with the character inconsistencies. Carrie Coon was great in the first movie as the kind of skeptic, um, or a protective mom. You know, whichever way you want to play her, she she can play both those roles. But now they've totally blunted any edge that made her interesting and. Paul Rudd is basically just reduced to being there to go, wow, cool, at everything. And the same with Wolfhard. They, they don't know what to do. I do agree that Kamel was the highlight of the movie. And that made it almost worthwhile, just his performance alone. I'd like to see them just make it the Kamel movie. He's brilliant. Uh, and he gets the Ghostbusters tone. Like, when you're, when you're watching Kamel be funny, but also, like, kind of mess around with the sci-fi element of it all. And, like, that's where I'm like, that's Ghostbusters. That's exactly what this tone should be. But the problem is they try 20 other things at the same time. So none of it worked. Like, at one stage, they, they, like, again, and, and uh, McKenna Grace is a great actress. I love her in Young Sheldon as well. Very, very underrated. I think she's going to go on and be a big star. But they just, like, they try to really, that attempt at a kind of queer love story, um, you felt they just didn't have the balls to kind of just pull the trigger on it. I think they were kind of using the kind of go woke, go broke logic where I they think, wanted to be like, problem. we've got yeah, a queer love like... story, but we don't want to do it because in case it offends anyone and we want to maximize our revenue here, you know? I think that's a problem though with a lot of these blockbusters when it comes to that. They kind of use that as like marketing. Disney are really bad for it as well, mm. where it'll be like, they're like, it's the first gay, I'm sure we've had like 50 first gay characters in Disney movies in the last two years. And then it's always like, I remember when it was like the first gay kiss in Star Wars and it was like in the background, out of focus. And you're meant to be like, 
Well done, Disney. Well done. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, and yeah, again, it's it's that thing where it's vague enough where you could interpret that as not a queer love story at all in this. Yeah. Um, if you really wanted to, so it's like, and I, I actually think another problem I had with the the character um of Phoebe is like she's very much Egon. Uh, and I think that really worked when the movie uh, Afterlife was so built around the passing of Harold Ramis and the Egon Spengler character. I think here it's just, I don't know. I feel like we need to see our character evolve a little bit more. Um, and I feel like that's kind of the problem with the movie in general. It feels like characters either changed without any rational explanation or on the other side, they just didn't change at all. Yeah. <laughs> and they gave no chance to change or grow. I think that's a real problem, especially when you have such a massive cast. But yeah, yeah, and and that's the thing. Ghostbusters rests on the characters, the names, the people you love. It's bollock sci-fi, but we're not here for good sci-fi. We're here to have fun at the movies and laugh. Um, and if you betray the characters to the point that no one seems recognizable for no one you like seems recognizable from the first, then why are we all here? And that kind of lays bare for me the kind of the disappointing reality of what Frozen Empire is they just want money they just want to get us in the cinema and paying and they're willing to you know play the song you know and they're willing to like show us all the things it felt like a theme park ride a bit it felt like literally you're waiting in the theme park and they have to have a story that builds you up while you're in the queue because it takes an hour to queue and that's what we watched but it wasn't it was a movie and there were, there wasn't even a roller coaster at the end of it and it didn't feel like a roller coaster it felt like I got to see 20 minutes of a good Kamel Nanjani movie and then I had to tolerate the rest. And unfortunately, no, this was a big miss for me apart from some high highlights. Um, Let's talk about Godzilla X Kong, another Empire movie, big month, March, love an Empire in March, we do. Uh, <laughs> the new Empire, the fifth entry into the kind of monster verse. I hadn't seen any others, but I felt safe enough that Godzilla X Kong wouldn't have the most intricate storyline and I could kind of pick it up as I go along. Um, are you a big MonsterVerse fan? Are you into the, the sequel or the, yeah, were you into the, the previous ones or? Yeah, uh, I um, I I would say in general, I'm a pretty big Godzilla fan. Yeah. Um, in fact, if we, if, if we were in my normal place where I have Blu-rays behind me, I'd have my, mo the most money I've ever spent on a Blu-ray set oh, is nice. a Godzilla set. Nice. Um, I bought this shirt because I don't see Godzilla merch in Ireland. So, um, and I think it's really interesting talking about the MonsterVerse because, honestly, the MonsterVerse is probably the only example, outside of maybe The Conjuring, that has managed to make a successful cinematic universe outside of Marvel. Mm. Everyone else has tried. Feels like the MonsterVerse is the only one that's kind of succeeded. This is the, what, the fifth film? Yeah. They've all done pretty well. It looks like based on opening weekend numbers, this one is going to do very well as well. They have a TV series on Apple that's apparently quite good. I, I think I only watched the first episode of it. And yeah, it's interesting. I think there's a real disconnect uh, for some people with this. Um, maybe that aren't familiar with Godzilla that have only seen Godzilla uh, minus one recently, which was outstanding. Yes. <laughs> but... Here is the big problem, and this is a problem if you're just a Godzilla fan in general. Like, Godzilla is a bit of a mess. It is a five star restaurant or a greasy fucking burger. You know, <laughs> like the I'm wearing the one I'm wearing now is the original Godzilla from 1954. Very mm -hmm. serious, dramatic film. People are surprised if they watch it uh, that it is that because it's a guy in a rubber suit. Um, but it didn't take long for him to just basically be slapping monsters around, like in the second one. He's fighting another monster in a big suit. And some people are like, oh, that's a, a metaphor for Nagasaki. And you're like, mm, okay. Mm. But then, you know, next two films later, he's like, you know, fucking body slamming a fucking dinosaur or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's the problem. People are, some people will go into this with minus one in their heads. And this is not that. It never has been that. Mm. Um, this is a film that I thought, uh, and I, again, I, I did not see reviews for this going in. I saw reviews that come out, but I didn't see it. I saw it. Um, on a Thursday screening here in America, uh, on a pretty big screen. <laughs> it wasn't nice. an IMAX, unfortunately, uh, but it did have those. It had weird recliner seats, which uh, spent about ten minutes just being like, "Ooh, <laughs> bed go up, bed go down, bed go up, bed go down." Um, and this is a mess. 
It's stupid. 10 out of 10, no notes. Loved it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, it's funny because we are on with Denny Villeneuve being on with, like, we don't need dialogue. I mean, you, you got his wish with this. I mean, how many scenes is it just of God, of just monkeys just making faces at each other and somehow you understand it? And what I love is there's some shots where it's a reaction of, like, Kong or Godzilla. And they just give a look and it's like, oh, I recognize that look because it's such a human look for a monkey to yeah. give. Like, there's one shot where it cuts a, a King Kong. King Kong is like, hmm. And we're meant to, and everyone's like, oh, yeah, yeah, tell it, McCong. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think the big question that everyone has about these Godzilla uh, movies and these King Kong movies and general monster movies is the human element. Everyone's always like, oh, there's too much humans. Uh, they should shut their mouth because the humans in this are, are barely in it compared to the other movies. And I think that worked. I mean, I think one big problem with the MonsterVerse is like, there's a real lack of cohesion in characters and stories, and that's fine because we generally do not give a shit about the characters in this because they're normally very one note, as they yeah. are in most of these Godzilla movies. Like they brought back Rebecca Hall here, and I genuinely was like, Was she in the last one? I don't remember her. Mm. And then uh, the only reason I remember it is because someone's like, Oh, I remember you from the last time. You've got a new haircut. I was like, That's it. It's a haircut. They gave her a simple Jack haircut for some reason. Um, I think it's like I said, it's a mess. It's Exactly what it says in the tin, though. It's the Ron Seal of movies. It's Godzilla with Kong. I think it, if there's a, a problem with this, it's that Godzilla really gets the short end of the stick here. It's basically a King Kong movie. Um, Godzilla is, you know, King Kong is like a whole story of like finding his his people and kind of surrogate adopting a son. Mm. <laughs> Just a weird sentence to think about. <laughs> home with Godzilla, you know? um, <laughs> and then Godzilla Daddy is just like... Up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm glad. I hope King Kong can be a good father. <laughs> like, yeah, um, Godzilla. Then his story is just like, oh, just sleep in the Coliseum of Rome. That's it. <laughs> um, it's actually the, the funniest thing I found about this movie, and it's like the whole. It's actually like a funny thing throughout all Godzilla movies. Is like it's always that thing of like, yay, Godzilla saved us from the monster destroying the city. Oh no, Godzilla is destroying the city. <laughs> 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 Thanks for saving us, Godzilla. No, Godzilla, no. <laughs> um, like I think it's actually another thing that's very impressive. And I don't want to get into film financing. This the the budget of this is like under two hundred million dollars, which mm-hmm. I thought was really impressive uh, for what it is. I think the effects are generally pretty good. Mm-hmm. Um, I think what it delivers in is that there is a lot of monster fighting in this, uh, which wasn't always the case of the other one. If you go back to Gareth Edwards' Godzilla movie in twenty fourteen, there was very little of that, and there was very little King Kong or not. Sorry, King Kong. There was no King Kong in it. Um, there was very little kind of Godzilla and people felt shortchanged by it. Uh, whereas this is just pure schlock. It's two CGI monsters beating the piss out of each other. Um, it's hilarious when they try to do something earnest because it does not work at all. Um, I I had a lot of fun with it. It okay. is dumb. It is not going to be everyone's cup of tea. But this is this is kind of what Godzilla is. Mm. Um and uh, King Kong is a kind of a different case because K- King Kong as as a film franchise is weird anyway because they basically just keep remaking the original and this one they didn't they did a prequel I, I don't think they actually are, are able to legally do a remake I don't know but anyway um so this is just kind of bits and pieces of all those things thrown together yeah. um so it is kind of a mess I don't think there's a lot you can say about it like the performances are fine I didn't think it was very Funny. There's a lot of lines that try to be funny that aren't good, and that's again coming down to the human characters. But I do understand they're a necessity to some degree. But literally every line they have is exposition. Mm. Like there's no line where it's like let's develop the character. Every line is like, "There, why, why is why are they doing this? What's going on there?" It's like it's like in case idiots in the audience are like, oh, "What's that mean?" And <laughs> then you know, fucking that podcaster guy again, another movie. The Godzilla and Kong and, and Ghostbusters are really similar. They both got Boca podcast characters. Yeah. They both got Empire their name. They're both like. <laughs> sequels to 2021 movies, I think. Uh, uh, but that came out during COVID. But anyway, uh, there's a lot of that. Dad Stevens is in this, having a ball. Um, I, I'm glad they pointed out that he that he's like a weird, like over the top cool vet. And he was wearing a Hawaiian shirt. And I was like, what character is this? He reminds me of someone. And then immediately they're like, Ace Ventura. I was like, thank God there I said it. <laughs> because I would have really annoyed me for the whole movie. But yeah, it's stupid. It's okay. stupid. But I thought it was really fun. Um, we mentioned uh, Mothra, the return of Mothra in this. Um, which that might be a spoiler, I don't know. <laughs> but <laughs> that um that was really fun. Uh, I think if you're a Godzilla fan, you're going to enjoy it. Uh, and I, when I say Godzilla fan, I mean like a fan of, 
you know, the big schlocky monster beat em up movies because that's what this is. I mean, mm. like if you've seen the trailers, it's Godzilla and King Kong running side by side into a big battle. Um, and then the, the director had the balls to come up and be like, yeah, it's inspired by 80s buddy cop movies like Lethal Weapon. <laughs> it was like, oh. Yeah, I was like, mate, don't pat yourself at the back of two hours. Like, you, put, you put a lizard and a monkey next to each other and had them charge. Yeah, okay. Um, although it is really funny, the start of this movie, it looks almost like King Kong is like in love with Godzilla, which yeah. I thought was like, he like hears a roar and he's like, is it? Oh no! And then, like, <laughs> and then when they, when they finally meet, it's like King Kong is like, "Hey, buddy!" And Godzilla's like, "Fuck you!" Um, trips over the fucking pyramids and gives yeah. him a suplex. It's amazing. How could you not like this movie? You know, I hear things like that. Um, but yeah, no, it's a big shocking mess. Uh, it's fun. It's when they say turn off your mind blockbuster, or, turn off your brain blockbuster. I think this is the definition of it. Um, mm. I think if you like shocky monster movies, you're going to enjoy it. If you want something more earnest, um, I don't know why you'd ever see this movie. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, you're not yeah. going. You're just not you know, going. But yeah, in general, though, no, I had fun with it. Uh, I like the MonsterVerse in general. I like Godzilla yeah. movies. I like Godzilla and Kong. I, I, I will say this. I hope they're, they're not learning. I think they learned the wrong lesson from Godzilla versus Kong. I think now they're just like, yeah, these monsters need to be together every time. No, give us a, just give us a Godzilla movie. Give us a King yeah. Kong movie again. Give us. I want to see more of that. I don't want to see every movie be like they're, they're together again. Yeah, that can only work so well. You can't keep doing Avengers movies. You know what yeah. I mean? It you was, need to it was wait. A bit forced. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a little bit. Yeah, but I think yeah, this is something that I think people are going to enjoy. Might is very very. But I think honestly, I think you kind of know going into it whether you're going to enjoy it yeah. or not. Yeah. Possibly. Fair. So, but yeah, it's not going to blow anyone's mind. But I, I had fun with it. I went into this like. um Fully expect. I wasn't expecting Godzilla minus one, which was one of my favorite movies last year. It was excellent, uh, fantastic. They nailed it. Uh, maybe the best Godzilla movie I've ever seen. Um, I went into this knowing full well what it was, and I wanted to come out of it feeling like you're feeling, where it was like it was dumb, it was fun, grand. I did not. I haven't seen uh, any of the MonsterVerse movies beforehand, but I have. Questions. <laughs> I have many questions for Godzilla X Kong. Question one Why do we need portals, spaceships, and two separate Earths to tell us a story about two monsters fighting? <laughs> like, why is Godzilla a superhero when his acts of heroism clearly have, like you said, massive collateral damage? It's like, he <laughs> saved us. It's like thousands clearly died. <laughs> yeah. Why does this movie need to have a chosen one arc? Why is there a chosen one in this movie? No one is. And why is it not Godzilla or Kong? How are they not the chosen one in Godzilla x Kong? <laughs> why does so much of it have nothing to do with Godzilla or Kong. It's just a bunch of characters with zero chemistry doing a caper that Indiana Jones would be like, yeah, you know what? I went back in time and there were aliens once and we like burn Nazis and stuff, but this is not realistic. <laughs> Why does Godzilla like tourists side so much? Why does he always go to all the big places like the Coliseum or Rio de Janeiro? Like, why does he not go to a farm in Trim? He's a dinosaur. He doesn't have delectable tastes. Why does nobody panic do, when he goes to the? I cons? do think, I do like. By the way, we did have loads of occasions. Maybe I did like how Godzilla knew to stand on the rock of Gibraltar to dive yeah. into the water. Yeah. He was like, "That's a good spot to dive." Yeah, he was very picturesque. Yeah, picking it off his holiday bucket list, like he's you <laughs> in New York. Like, why does like but when he goes to the Coliseum? Why does he go? Why does nobody panic when he goes to sleep there? And it's just like, ah, there is peace on Earth again. <laughs> Did one person die in this movie? Did we see someone die? Because I'm pretty sure millions died throughout the action that we saw. But did we actually see anyone die? Like, what? Why was there a big moth? Is that a spoiler? Why is that? I didn't ask for Godzilla Kong and a moth, maybe. Why That's was there Mothra. a spoiler? How dare you? How dare you disrespect Mothra? Mothra why does Godzilla's ally. Why does Godzilla... <laughs> Why does Godzilla's face look like a granny who's been cryogenically frozen? <laughs> Why was the mother in this going, I'm going to allow my daughter to be a very central figure in these monsters battling? Like, and... Why is she perceived as like a supportive mother when it's like, I will leave you here with these people if you want. <laughs> who was fighting who at the end? I'm like, the pink Godzilla, the blue Godzilla. Like, what's what's the pink Godzilla? What's the blue? I just didn't understand 
this. I was entertained by the randomness of it. I was I I like watching bad movies. I, I like I, I like it because I like my experience watching them and how I can kind of take away from it. That was my experience here. But for me, and don't get me wrong, it, there are a lot of people who, again, I agree with you. If you think you're going to love this, you're going to love it. it. It is very much what it is. Um, I did not love this. <laughs> Just to give you the, the other flip side. I don't think I'm being haughty here. I don't think I'm being snobby or anything. I just it it just wasn't was was not for me. Yeah, I think, I think this, is, this is probably the most you've disagreed on a movie so far. I think. Interesting. I think it's. I think it is also that thing where like, yeah, this is. All Godzilla movies are kind of a like, um, unless unless you're going into like the 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 intricacies of are they wearing a suit, are they not wearing a suit, but like all these Godzilla movies are kind of the same. Mm. Um, like, if you ask me. Like Godzilla versus Godzilla versus Kong. Sorry, I forgot this is Godzilla X Kong, which sounds like yeah. some weird fashion collab. <laughs> <laughs> but like, um, yeah, those movies are like almost indistinguishable um, between them. And I, I, I do think I preferred Godzilla versus Kong. Mm. Um, but yeah, again, I will say, and it's weird because you mentioned something there, and I think it's something that I, I want to get back to in a sec, which is they're doing nostalgia stuff in these movies as well but they're doing it to an audience that has to be really minimal like the gods of the fan base the fan base the fan base of the japanese gods in the movies has to be minuscule um to a, a a western audience last time it was uh they brought back mecha godzilla this time uh you know they're bringing back mothra what the the whole storyline of that girl uh kind of getting to control mothra and be mothra's kind of protector i'm assuming is meant to be a nod to the original uh, Mothra in the, the Japanese movies where there's kind of two um, uh, kind of girls that guard Mothra and, and command Mothra so I'm guessing it's a thing like that but no one is except the most intricate fan is going to get that and these movies shouldn't be going for just the fans of the Japanese Godzilla because then they wouldn't make money Yeah, um, and I think that's why they're kind of mindless yeah again the characters in this don't matter yeah um, <laughs> and, and yeah like I said I do, I do think it is a case of you kind of know what you're getting um, yeah you either you're gonna love it or you're gonna hate it. Um, it, it if think, you look, if you yeah. look at the ads and think, I oh, am, yeah, man, that's gonna be class crack. Like, and go have a few drinks in the cinema or whatever, and have a laugh. Like, it, it's for you. Um, for me, no, I just, I just didn't get what I wanted out of it. But it is what it is, and like again, you will enjoy it if you look at it and go, yeah, I'm gonna enjoy that. Uh, from one uh monster movie, I want to talk about. Uh, a movie I don't, it's not on your list, so I don't know if you've seen it. And I looked at it and I was like, this is a Tom movie. I literally thought of you while I was watching this. This is you all over. Because we're going from a monster movie to a movie called Monster. Um, and this is right up your alley. Monster. Tom, this might end up on your year-end top 10 list. Um because I remind you, if you if you didn't tune in for our top 10 movies in 2023 discussion, Tom's top two movies were Close and Blue Jean. Uh, and this is like a combination of those two mixed with, I don't know if you saw Iranian movie, The Hero from 2022. No. Um, a Hero is really, really good because it just takes a really simple idea and it just stretches it out in every way. It looks at it from every single an angle. Um, and ask a very simple question: Is this man a hero, or is he not, or is he a fraud? Um, where, but it it really like it, it close and blue gene are the elements that I thought of when I thought of this. So basically, it's a Japanese movie, um, made by Koreeda Hirokazu. Um, it starts off with a child called Mungino who seems trouble, who seems a troubled child at the start, still dealing with kind of his father's death. He's really distant with his mother, and he has a kind of fixation on the little things in life, like dirt. You know what I mean? He's very grounded and looking at kind of the world in a very different way, but seems quite distracted. Um, early into the movie, he makes a claim that a teacher had hit him, um, which caused him to seem to have some kind of uh neurological impact or psychological we don't really know uh he said that the teacher told him he had a pig's brain and there's an investigation with the school that seems almost deliberately infuriating um until it eventually comes out that he's been accused of bullying another child and that's kind of the setup for the movie it's kind of straightforward simple and very domestic 
But then what the movie does is they set that up and you kind of see it from the mother's point of view. But then we see the exact same story retold twice more. One is with the teacher's point of view. Um, uh, Mr. Hero, his name is. And uh, the other is from Mungino's point of view. And we see the exact same story and they're completely different each time we see it. And it is a movie about perspective and about differences and how people see the world and how if you see things slightly different to one other person, how you mightn't see what's actually happening right in front of your eyes. Koryeda Hirokazu directs this kind of a script from Yuji Sakamoto. Um, it's a movie that's really content to genre hop throughout. It starts as what seems like the first 20 minutes, you're like, oh, this is a mystery. This is a mystery box. And then you're like, there might be some supernatural stuff in here. This is really interesting. Like, what? why is this movie? But then it kind of settles into, and you're probably listening to that thinking, close meets blue jean. How could there okay. be supernatural stuff in there? But then it kind of becomes that as you cut the full picture emerges. There's some really, really tight script in here. Like uh, at one stage, the girlfriend of one character turns around and is like, never believe a woman's next time or a man's, it's going to be fine. Uh, and I'm like, really just clever stuff that sticks with you. And you're kind of, uh, or I, I don't need, like there's a, there's a whole philosophical conversation around happiness. And it's like, if only some people can have happiness, then that's not what happiness is. Happiness shouldn't be reserved for the few. It should be uh, kept for the many. Um, And there is a lot going on here in terms of like, like trying to juggle a lot of things, but it's a movie that really has a strong vision. Even if you're not across what the vision is, you eventually are by the end of it. And you're like, wow, bravo. That was fucking genius because at all times you're like, I don't know what's going on. I don't know if this movie is going to stick the landing. Then it really, really fucking does. The kind of central theme of the movie is why is it called monster? Like who's the monster here? Is it Mungino? Is it the teacher? Is it, bureaucracy as a whole is it the world and it's not really interested in answering that question it just likes to ask the question and then leave it there and leave it for you to decide and get it gives you different perspectives on the same story and um kind of then like will hold a lot back and then reveal its hand in its own time um even up until the last third like usually the last third is wrapping up the first two acts and you're kind of like right this is where the story's going and it's like no 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 this is the real story and then you're like, holy fucking shit, all of that. And it makes sense. It doesn't seem forced. It doesn't seem convoluted. It's, it becomes something really tender and beautiful in a way the movie just never seemed to. It's like a caterpillar just becoming a butterfly right in front of you, um, which is really disarming. And it's a movie that, again, just seems quite cold and clinical and very factual but actually then like blossoms and just becomes a movie so full of heart in a mo in a way that it just never seemed like it would. Monster is an excellent story. And the more I talk about it and reflect on it, the more I like this movie. It's so genius the way they kind of play it out. It's such a pleasant surprise. And it's really, really effective in telling the sto a story about the power of our own biases and our own perceptions and how we look at things and how if you view a story through one lens, it's one thing. If you view it through another person's lens, it's something completely different. And if you view it through what's actually happening, it's you might you might miss the entire purpose of the story altogether. It's not only like a great story with loads of lessons and things stuff to think about and take away, but it is um it is an experiment in storytelling at the same time. Um, and it's so unique, so well taught through, so handled with care. And again, like in a way that throughout the movie, you're like, I don't know if they're going to get this right. I don't know if this is going to work. I don't know how they're going to do this. And then you're like, holy shit. And you just find yourself blown away. Um, and again, it's just the differences that one or two little white lies we tell can make and how that changes and shapes someone and how they see the world and how they think of things and how something can appear to be one thing on the face of it. And then it's actually something else. And then um, how those differences in perceptions can just totally impact another person's life. It is brilliant. Monster, uh, go check it out. I'm not sure if it's still in cinemas. Uh, it got a very limited release over here, but go out of your way. Tom, I think it's going to be right up your alley you haven't seen i'm yeah. right in saying you haven't seen it yet i, I haven't seen it no what, what always happens with these movies it happens a lot with foreign language or independent films is i hear about it here it's good look up the screen things in, in cork and it's never showing and then i it slips out of my head so yeah. i'm glad you're writing me about it i just looked it up it's not 
I don't think knows the Citizen is in Ireland. It's not available on streaming. It's on streaming in America. You can rent it in America, certainly. So uh, I'd be able to check it out. It sounds very much like Rashomon uh, and um, Mads Mikkelsen's film The Hunt a little bit. Mm. Uh, it kind of reminds me of both the way you describe them a little bit. But yeah, no, that sounds right up my alley. So definitely go and check yeah. it out. Maybe even by next episode, I'll be able to check in and tell you if it's uh, if it's uh, up to my taste. But yeah, yeah. sounds Let me know. Amazing. Let, let me know. Out. We we are time for time, but I do want to touch on one thing. I want to touch mm-hmm. on Sydney Sweeney's new horror movie, Immaculate. Um, yeah. So talk to me about Immaculate. What were your own thoughts? Um. Well, yeah. You know when you watch a film and you you think you have it pegged, uh, <laughs> and then it, it, you don't at all. Um. This was an interesting one because like Sydney Sweeney is is kind of the hot name at the moment, you know. Um. And I think like there's a lot of people that are, because she's such an attractive woman people that are easy kind of push her aside as, as being a, t- a talented uh, actress I mean she was very good in reality last year uh, I thought uh, and she can give great performances as well and I think because um, of her looks I think people were very easily going to brush aside as like oh it's sexy nun movie it's not at all um, yeah. like, don't get me wrong there is a little bit of that I mean like Obviously, even though it's a modern nunnery, the director or someone made the choice of being like, now it's time for the nuns to have a bath. All the nuns into the bath together, yeah. wash each other, and make sure you're wearing your white see-through clothes, nuns. <laughs> okay? Um, but yeah, aside from that, I was really surprised how much I enjoyed this. Oh, okay. Um, and I was surprised at how grisly it was at times. Um, it was a lot more violent than I expected. Now, I will say, it's a bit B movie schlock, mm. uh, for a lot of it. Um, I think initially it, it it takes a while to get going. Um, few too many jump scares. Like I didn't think if you got rid of those, it wasn't a very scary film. Uh, there were certainly moments that were unsettling. I thought the violence parts of it were a little bit extremist as well. Um, mm. there was moments where I literally was kind of wincing or looking away. Maybe it's just because of the particular type of violence they were using. Uh, anything to do with fingernails oh god <laughs> I don't know makes weirds me out um, but I thought she was very good in this film um, I thought the film itself worked um, it's you know I do think it kind of becomes I won't say stupid but it becomes very schlock is the word I'm going to use I've yeah. used that word a few times it's very schlocky towards the end um, and I, I will say it's not exactly, you know, subtle with its its political leanings or affiliations. Um, you know, I think if you think about it for two seconds, you'll know what that means. Like, hey, guess what? Uh, religion is dictating what a woman does with her body. Uh, see where we're going? Um, which, you know, I think it's an important message regardless. But um, I think as a film, I thought this was better than I expected it to be. Maybe it's because... I, when it comes to like low budget horror films, uh, especially ones to do with religion, they're often not great. Um, they're often very one note. Uh, and I think normally, as we see with horror films with nuns in them, it's either, oh, creepy nun, sexy nun. And this wasn't either of those. It was just a character who happened to be a nun um, and had that, that kind of religious leaning. Uh, for those who don't know, the plot is basically that Sydney Sweeney is uh, this nun that goes to uh, this nunnery, is that the word? <laughs> a co- a co- convent? I don't know. Uh, in Italy. Uh, and some strange things start happening. Uh, and essentially, that means that uh, there's kind of a conspiracy of what's going on. And I don't know, is it a spoiler, but the word immaculate is in the title. So that leads to her, you know, uh, getting pregnant and no clear reason why. And it's kind of a question of, how did this happen? What does this mean? And it takes a really crazy right turn uh, in the last act. And that's probably what everyone's going to talk about. I think the big discussion point is going to be the final scene. Yeah. Which was shocking. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but yeah, maybe it was just that I went in with a very, 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 very low bar. But I thought it was pretty decent. It was better than I expected it to be. Uh, maybe that's the most I can hope for. But uh, yeah, and I think it definitely kind of I think it's a brave choice by Sydney Sweeney because she was very involved in the production just as a, a producer mm. and, a, and an actress as well. Come, going from like, you know, being such a, a hot name and obviously she probably didn't realise what her profile was going to be before uh, she made this film. But, I mean, she didn't have to make a film like this uh, that was as, as balls to the wall. It could have just been lazy, cheap horror. Uh, and I think it kind of, a few times when it kind of broke out of that box. It's not a perfect film, 
It's not even probably a great film, but I think it's if you're looking for a horror film, I think you could do much worse than this one. Okay, interesting. I thought this was a real litmus test moment for Sydney Sweeney because, mm-hmm. um, again, I don't think anyone, including herself, probably predicted the success of anyone but you, kind of, if oh. you saw it, which is a very generic kind of rom-com. And it's quite good and quite funny as rom-coms go, and as that style of movie goes, but it was an absolute blockbuster, and I think it was a real coming-out moment for her. Um, And then, obviously, she went down with the Madam Web ship uh, there just recently. So, again, this is kind of like, right, can she hold this up uh, as a solo act uh, in a completely different genre? It's directed by Michael Moanoff, a script by Andrew Lavelle, uh, being produced by Sweeney's own 5050 Films. Um, I agree with a lot of what you say. I think maybe the only difference we have here is that I went in... I'm a huge fan of Sweeney. Uh, I loved her work in reality. I loved her in White Lotus and Euphoria. Um, so I've got quite a high opinion of her to the point my girlfriend is really jealous of her. <laughs> but um, like I maybe went in with my expectations a bit too high because I think attaching her to this project gave me those expectations that it is an elevated horror. There's going to be a real story here. I thought it was a platform for Sweeney to act and show some... Um, range that she's never got a chance to show by being kind of curtailed to certain genres of movies and again I, I admired the baldiness of her to go into that and I think she can act um and I think like she she kind of showed that here and she she succeeded she can tick the box and say I gave a good performance here for me it just didn't have enough bite that maybe I was hoping for or expecting here like you said there was a lot of jump scares there was a lot of spooky effects there was a lot of lighting like the color red is a constant for obvious reasons here which is a bit eye rolling and it's a bit student movie level kind of levels of imagination at times i looked at this and i'm like this is a bit of a poor man's poor things you know what i mean i'm like it's it's poor things without the the cleverness you know and it's just someone getting to kind of play play things a bit kooky and wild um you know, it, it pushes the ending really hard. And in that kind of, I guess we have to address it. And I won't kind of get into the, the hows and the whats and the whys. But Sweeney definitely does act in the ending. Like there's a, a kind of extremely long and distressing in a way, kind of one shot close up with a lot of kind of screaming and bodily trauma occurring off camera. But for me, the problem with that was if that is at the end of an amazing movie, then fuck me, like, you've done the thing. But it just didn't feel earned, you know what I mean? And a lot of smart people, yourself included, who I consider have a really good palette for kind of the difference between good horror and nonsense are, are praising this. So there's there's also the possibility that just I wasn't in the mood for this, and if I watched it again, maybe I'd rethink it. Um, But for me, like I said, there's just not much meat on the bones. Like, she's a nun because the Catholic Church has a reputation as mistrustful and there's a lot of imagery that they can play with if they kind of get into that world. But why did any of this happen? What were anyone's motives in this? What message is the movie trying to send us? And it's seriously lacking in all of those departments. And again, if it's just a generic horror movie, you know what I mean? If it's if it's called The Immaculate, <laughs> I know what I'm getting there because it's just like, right, it's going to be shy. It's going to be jump scares. It's going to be spooky. Um, But it's Immaculate with Sydney, Sw- Sydney Sweeney. It's really well marketed. It's really cleverly marketed. So I'm expecting it to be, I don't like the term elevated horror, but I'm expecting it to be good horror, you know? Uh, and it just never lived up to that. Um. For me, like, I don't think it harms Sweeney in any way. I think it'll help her carry it. And I think she's getting a lot of kudos for this. And I'm glad because I think she's a really, really strong actress who deserves the level of acclaim she's getting because I think a lot of people write off. And these are people who probably haven't seen reality and seen the scope of what Sweeney can do. I think a lot of people write off her success as being a, a result of her looks. Um, and that's not the case. She's an amazing actress. And I think that's what she went into this. She literally covered herself up and dressed as a nun to show us that she's an amazing actress. But that's I was the gonna problem. Say, I, think, I think that's exactly what, like for, for someone like you, well, that's very familiar with work. I think like that last scene, especially, yeah. is a message to everybody else. Yeah. Like, yeah, she's not afraid to get get dirty and get down and, and get covered in blood and all this stuff. She's not afraid to shed that that, that image. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I think that's going to be an eye opener for a lot of people. 
And but I think that's kind of what I didn't like about the movie because it felt like the movie was trying to prove a meta point to me rather than actually being a good movie. Yeah. You know what I mean? It felt like there was a lot going on where I'm like, yeah, I see what you're doing and stuff like that, and I see what you're going for. But I'm very aware of the writers' room here. I'm very aware of the production meetings that are happening here. I'm very aware of this is going to be where Sydney Sweeney shows them. And again, like it just ne it's never wrapping me up in the actual story itself. I'm not thinking about anything beyond what. Sydney's Sweeney's career arc after this, you know, that is it's the Sydney Sweeney show. Um, and I'm I'm all up for the Sydney Sweeney show, love it. Um, but again, there's just not much more to that than this. It's not a bad movie by any means. If you're looking for if you're at a loose end at the weekend and horrors up your alley, it's fine. Um, and again, I definitely think that she proved her point. She's not a just a beautiful uh, blonde bombshell st Hollywood starlet that's going to be here now and forgotten the next minute. I think she's here to stay and I think she deserves her stardom and her moment. Um, but I don't know if this is the career defining moment that she maybe thought it was because instead of just finding a good project to work on, she went out and made a movie to have a career defining moment. And that made this kind of lose some structural integrity for me in terms of like connecting with it as a, as a viewer. Um, Anyway, we do have to go. We do. We have seen some other movies, but we do have to cut it for time. But uh, if you want to check out uh, Tom on the Popco Pod, uh, that would be a good place to check out some of his other movie news and views. Uh, Tom, we're going to get back to. Uh, we're going to be back at the end of April. Um, is there any movies in particular that you're looking forward to that's coming out that you're kind of saying, right, that's the one I can't wait to talk about? Yeah, there's a few. Um, I, I there's Monkey Man is coming out mm -hmm. uh, with uh, Dev Patel uh, directing, starring, uh, real, written this crazy action movie that I'm pretty interested in seeing. Uh, Civil War, Alex Garland's movie is coming out. I want to know how that's going to turn out. Yeah. I'm not sure it's going to be good or bad, especially because Alex Garland, uh, I think yesterday basically said he's done directing for the moment. Um, oh, he said he's kind of grown tired of the process. So hopefully this will be. No idea. A final film. I won't be a final film, but you know. Yeah. Um. Aside from that, uh, Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare could be interesting. But yeah, no, I think April is going to be a, an interesting month of some films we might see that are unexpected that might surprise us. Yeah. Uh, because other than that, it's kind of a few select films that could be good. So yeah, interesting stuff ahead. I'd say in April. Yeah, April like is usually good for finding a good hidden gem. You know what I mean? Go down to your local. If you're in Dublin, go to the Lighthouse. You know what I mean? Uh, if you're in Galway, go to Palace. Go down to your local independent filmmakers. We are intrigued by Civil War as well. You've got Alex Garland. I didn't know that. That was just, uh, mm -hmm. that was interesting. Really underwhelmed me with men. I thought it was a good idea, yeah. but just not executed that well. Uh, but a kind of dystopian thriller. There's a lot to like about this. Dystopian thriller. Nick Offerman kind of at the peak of his dramatic powers and a kind of resurgent curse and dunce like there's a lot I of people I refuse who, to believe the world could go to shit as Nick with Nick off from his presence that just couldn't happen so <laughs> like, we'd be fine the world would be a better place I also am um, looking forward to seeing Challengers it's got Z yes. Zendaya sex tennis it's everything I ever wanted but never got from the recently cancelled Netflix docudrama um, Breakpoint so yeah I'm, I'm big up for Challengers um, Tom also on top of that what's going on in your world uh, when you get back on the Pop Club Pod yeah, I've got a lot of stuff to catch up on uh, and make. Uh, hopefully, going to start up uh, a series that I haven't touched in a while. I'm not going to say the name of it because then I'll be Me. guilting myself <laughs> into not getting it done. <laughs> um, what I will say is, I just put out a, a video. It's a re release of a video. Uh, it's doing really, really well. Uh, and if you are a Ghostbusters fan, I'd urge you to check it out. It's basically why we never got a proper Ghostbusters 3 with the original cast. And it documents the history of that, why we'll probably never really get. That Ghostbusters 3. Uh, but yeah, it's doing really well on YouTube. I encourage people to check it out. It's really fun. Amazing. Good stuff. Check it out. Popco Pod. Uh, I have the link in the show notes. Uh, subscribe on YouTube. Uh, well worth your time. Tom, thanks for joining us for March at the Movies. We will chat next month for April at the Movies. In the meantime, next time on page 180, later this week, we're going to be discussing the Invincible finale. If you haven't already, one last reminder uh, for WrestleMania in the World Shed. I cannot wait. Uh, but that is all for us now. Uh, until next time, this has been page 180. I've been Jer Leggett, and the podcast is too humble to say that it is over. Even more reason to know it is. As written!